deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. The shape and motion of the earth, the origin of life, who is God and what's his name? These are all big concepts to be sure, but what about another one? What about what year is it really? As most of the world gets ready to celebrate, or at least acknowledge, the new year of 2024, there's another much smaller group of people that says they're celebrating 29 years too early. You should be making New Year's resolutions for 1995, not 2024. So say the pre-Nicene Christians. And to understand why, we have to go back. No, way back. So far back, in fact, we have to stop for gas and snacks on the way there at a rest stop called the year 525 A.D. And by the way, A.D. stands for Anno Domini. That's Latin for in the year of our Lord. And it's part of the calendar era system used by the Julian and Gregorian dating systems that you're familiar with. And it's hard to imagine something more important than dates and calendars. Everything depends on it. When you pay your taxes, your birthday, your anniversary, court dates, your next flight, official records of all kinds, without it, it's hard to imagine a functioning society. And surely something that the entire world relies on to be 100% accurate was created by a powerful council of learned elders, professors, mathematicians, and scientists, uh, probably even Plato and Socrates himself weighed in on this. I mean, the stakes couldn't be any higher. For something this big to be taken at face value as unassailable and unquestioned fact and reality, some pretty heavy hitters in the intellectual world must have given our calendar system the green light, right? Well, Let's step into that 525 A.D. gas station and meet all these bigwigs that created our calendar. Hey, Darren Kalama here with uh, PCTV. Uh, just thought I'd come in and check in with you guys. Is there anyone here? Hello. Hi, I'm Dionysus Exiguous. Looks like five bucks on pump four, cash or credit. Oh, wow. Uh, no, I was just expecting something... Well, I was kind of expecting more of you, I think. Nope, I'm the one and only. And I'm a little busy working on a brand new calendar right now. You need anything else? Okay, I guess I'll come clean here. I didn't actually meet Dionysus at a gas station in Romania 1,500 years ago. But here's what we do know about Dionysus Exegus and the calendar he created in 525 A.D., he was born in, well, let's just call it 470 A.D., and he was a Romanian monk. Long story short, although he developed the A.D. calendar era in 525 A.D., it wasn't fully accepted until about the 9th century, and it was meant to replace the Diocletian calendar, which ended in the year 247. The underlying goal of this project was to make everything fit his Easter tables, which had something to do with lunar cycles and a feud with the Orthodox side of Christianity. Anyway, none of that has much bearing on today's episode, so we'll just go ahead and drive past that part for now. And short story shorter, there's no year zero, and Dionysus didn't bother explaining to anyone how it was he actually decided on which year Jesus was born. The closest he came to an underlying thesis or premise was the following statement. The present year was the consulship of Probus Jr., which was 525 years, quote, since the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, unquote. And of course, incarnation could mean anything. Does it mean conception? Does it mean the nativity? Is the dating for Probus Jr. and the reign of others before him actually correct? Well, the answers that follow are an absolute tar pit and morass of indecipherable gibberish, gematria, verbal gymnastics, and word salads that would probably drive you insane if you looked into it deeply enough. But in the spirit of full disclosure, I feel compelled to give you the links to this bundle of nonsense in the show notes so that you can see for yourself until your eyes glaze over. Again, I don't recommend it, but do as you must. 
Bottom line is that Dionysus never established a date certain for the birth of Jesus, but most scholars seem to gravitate around the theory of around uh, 6 to 4 BC-ish. Luckily, though, we can all just grab a copy of the Judeo-Christian Bible, oops, I'm sorry, the King James Bible, and just flip a couple pages to find out when Jesus was born. I mean, almost half of that Bible is about Jesus, and it's kind of important. I mean, when something big like that, the, the Son of God, the Savior is born, I'm sure somebody made a note of it with enough details to pinpoint the day. Or maybe during his time uh, with the apostles, one of them said, hey, you know what, guys? Let's all take up a collection and give Jesus a present for his 30th birthday. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and flip through this Bible real fast and pop that day out. Hmm, okay, well, no luck on the day, but I'm sure they have a year here somewhere. Hmm, or, or maybe they mention a special event that would tell us the year. No, not, not having any luck. Well, as it turns out, none of the four Gospels, which, by the way, were all written by anonymous authors, none of the four Gospels tells us a day or even year. In fact, of the four, only two even mention a birth. Now, I find that a little odd because as humans, we tend to have holidays and celebrations marking just about everything. In fact, we even have 365 national holidays and name days every year. For example, did you know that April 30th is National Bubble Tea Day? And October 28th is National First Responders Day. Think about that. Bubble Tea Day is officially recognized, but the birthday of the Son of God is unknown. It's a complete mystery. The bottom line is that our AD calendar is based on a year nobody can agree upon, which in turn is based on the writings of two anonymous authors who also failed to cite a day or year. And it's all very confusing. It's almost like it's, oh, I don't know. It's almost like the confusion is on purpose or something. So weird. In a way, it reminds me of the famous line from the Walter Scott poem uh, called Marmion. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. You know, as an aside, sometimes webs of lies get so tangled that you have to create an entire apologetics industry just to try and explain them all. But I digress. Now, before I take a big lighter to this tangled web of nonsense, I want you to keep a specific verse in mind as the flame of the lighter passes under and through the web of our story. It's from 1 Corinthians 14.23, quote, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And you know, I like to think of that verse as a big lighter when I listen to Judaizers and Judeo-Christians ramble on with their fantastic tales of theological pablum, the twirling magic chickens over their heads, and dancing on the head of a pin while entangling themselves and everyone around them in webs of deceptions and lies. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Yeah, I like that. Let's remember it as we start our work here. And don't worry, it won't take long, because finding the answer that has confounded all of these theologians, biblical scholars, and has their entire apologetics industry bouncing off the walls of a padded room is as easy as turning to the very first page and the very first sentence of the very first Bible. Let's read it together. In the fifteenth year of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Jesus descended into Capernaum, a city in Galilee. And what year would that be, according to Dionysus? Oh, that's right, 29 AD. The 15th year of Caesar's reign corresponds to 29 AD. And by the way, some pre-Nicene denominations used the total solar eclipse of that same year to determine that the exact arrival of Jesus was actually November 24th at precisely 11.05 a.m. And we have a separate episode which covers that in full. And by the way, one of our viewers of that episode noted that during an eclipse, that, well, that would be a great time to descend from heaven. 
Now let's do a quick hot take on that first sentence. There's nothing about two Jews in a Bethlehem horse stall, and there's nothing about Nazareth. What we do have is Jesus descending into Capernaum and taking on a fully human form in 29 AD of the calendar era. Now that leaves us with a 29-year gap between the Bethlehem horse stall fairy tale and when Jesus actually arrived on earth. A 29-year gap between an anonymous author's Judaized imagination and reality. And that reality, of course, being the first Christian Bible of 144 AD from the Gospel of the Lord in the very first sentence. And by the way, you can get a free copy of that at theveryfirstbible.org.org. So 29 years, let's, uh, let's think about that. I don't recall 29 years of stories in any of the Gospels from the anonymous authors. Do you? And would you like to know why? Well, it's because Jesus wasn't there. You see, instead, they tried to fill that gap by saying Jesus didn't do anything, didn't, quote, start his ministry, unquote, until he was 30 years old. That's right. They would have you believe the Son of God just slept on Mom's couch until he was 30, and then she kicked him out, and he finally said to himself, you know what, I'm the Son of God, and I'm just going to go ahead and start a street corner ministry in some rural neighborhoods around here. Give me a break. How they keep schlepping this story with a straight face is absolutely beyond me. Now, hopefully by giving you some context, it frees some of you from whatever Yahweh delusion syndrome you're suffering from. The plain fact is that God was only revealed to us through Jesus, not before. And Jesus arrived on earth the same way he left it, ascending and descending and becoming fully human for the brief years he arrived for our salvation. You see, Jesus transcends race, and he didn't play favorites. He didn't act as somebody's celestial real estate agent. It's very simple. It's not complicated. Remember, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Now I'm going to show you the pre-Nicene calendar, which reflects the belief of millions of the first Christians that preceded you, reflects the reality of things before the Council of Nicaea and the attempt to erase reality and replace it with a Judaized delusion through the use of a Domnatio Memoriae. Now, for those of you listening on the PCRN radio network or the Pre-Nicene Perspective podcast, I'll have a link to the calendar in the show notes, but it's really pretty simple. We have Prin affixi, that's Greek for before arrival or PA, and we have meta affixi, again Greek for after arrival or MA, so PA and MA. And by the way, your Christian roots are Greek, not Latin. Everybody in the Roman Empire, including Jews and the anonymous authors of the four Gospels, spoke and wrote in Greek. Everybody. Your conversation with Jesus? That's right spoken in Greek. Okay, here's where we see it all on the pre-Nicene calendar. Jesus descends from heaven into Capernaum and takes on a fully human form in 1 MA. In 4 MA, Jesus is crucified and ascends to heaven on the third day, descending and ascending. In 115 MA, the first Christian Bible is compiled. In 296 MA, we have the abomination known as the Council of Nicaea, and in 351 MA, the Catholic Church finally releases its own version of a Bible. Of course, with the Torah books and its Yahweh deity stapled to the front of it. Add 29 years to any of those dates, and you see exactly where that gap was. So what does it all mean? Well, it means enjoy 1995 again, and this time make your New Year's resolution to reconnect with pre-Nicene Christianity. That's going to wrap it up for today's episode, but before I go, I'd like to uh, go ahead and knock out a little bit of viewer mail real fast. This one is from Mike T. in Ohio, and by the way, this subject comes up a lot in discussion groups, so I do want to hit this. Hi, Darren. Uh, was canon specifically included or excluded as part of the proceedings of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. 
Okay, Mike, I think you meant 296 MA, not 325 AD. No, I'm just kidding. We'll have to make some allowances until everybody gets on board with the pre-Nicene calendar. The short answer to your question is yes, and it's an answer that people ingrained with the teachings from the apologetics industry do not want to hear. Their heads do a 180 and they start walking on ceilings when you tell them that the inclusion and exclusion of books for the Bible was decided at the council. Now, we've done entire episodes on this. They'll scream at you, no, it was just to decide on the Arian heresy. Now, this is also around the time that they start levitating and throwing furniture around the room. But at the end of the day, there are two facts that they can't dispute, and it's like watching a scene from the Exorcist movie when you explain it to them. The first is that Emperor Constantine, who presided over the council and was still worshipping the Roman sun god Sol Invictus during the 29 days it was in session, ordered 50 copies of the new Bible decided on at the council. He instructed Eusebius, yes, that Eusebius, who is known as the father of church history, to have 50 copies of the new Bible made right after the Council of Nicaea ended. We know it today as the Codex Vaticanus. And luckily, we have a copy of Constantine's order for the new Bibles. You know what? I have an idea. Let's read it together right now. Quote, I have thought it expedient to instruct your prudence to order 50 copies of the sacred scriptures, the provision and use of which you know to be most needful for the instruction of the church, to be written on prepared parchment in a legible manner and in a convenient portable form by professional transcribers thoroughly practice in their art." Unquote. Wow, he sounds so pleasant and polite in that letter, doesn't he? And that makes it all the more interesting to note that the year after the council ended, Constantine executed his wife and firstborn son. <laughs> The wife was boiled alive, and his son was made to drink poison. Sorry, I got a little distracted there. W where was I? Yeah, the, the second confirmation of canon inclusion it comes to us from none other than St. Jerome himself, the very same saint who translated the Bible from Greek to Latin. So, I think we can agree he may have known a thing or two about the Bible, right? Now, Jerome, in his prologue to Judith, makes the claim that the book of Judith was, quote, found by the Nicene Council to have been counted among the number of the sacred scriptures, unquote. Yeah, there was a whole lot more going on than just talking about the Arian heresy, and St. Jerome just confirmed it. And by the way, you can also read that quote in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Thank you very much for your question, Mike. I hope that was helpful. And lastly, just a housekeeping note, the pre-Nicene Christian Ecclesia, which is the non-denominational group that helps promote pre-Nicene Christianity worldwide, will be opening a small outreach office in Argentina next month. Now, if you live there and you're bilingual and you want to help out a little bit, you can send them an email. Their address is outreach at pre-nicene.org. Just put a dash between pre and nicene. Outreach at pre-nicene.org. Now, word on the street is that uh, Christians are going to need all the help they can get in that country. So we wish them well in what is sure to be a fairly difficult endeavor. This has been Darren Kalama wishing you a Happy New Year on behalf of everyone at Pre-Nicene Perspective. We'll see you on the other side. You've been listening to Pre-Nicene Perspective. To learn more about the first Bible and the first Christians, visit theveryfirstbible.org.